What is going on, people? We are Tottenham TV here, back again with another Tottenham update. You might have noticed to my left, well, to my, well, to your right, you have Brains McLeod. You do not have my brother Ben Daniel with us today. He is taking a few days off. So we have Brains very kindly filling in for the Tottenham updates. How are we doing, Brains? Thanks for coming on. Not bad, no worries. Just 10x you there. The upgrade on. <laughs> Being lazy, fine, whatever, I'm in. Damn it, brings in. Exactly. That's what the people are calling for, apparently. Uh, don't tell Ben <laughs> that. Uh, <laughs> all right. First up, we're going to be talking about Tottenham's protracted managerial search yet again. And the first story is about the man of the moment, Julian Nagelsmann. And according to Sport One, there have been no, there have not been any concrete talks or discussions at the moment between Tottenham and Julian Nagelsmann. The coach, the, the, the only, this, the concrete talks will only take place once Spurs have a new sporting director in place. The German coach does not want to leave anything to chance. However, um, the Evening Standard have reported today um, in an article said that Julian Nagelsmann is still the favourite for the role um, and talks are be are going to continue between the clubs once a sporting director has been appointed. So, look, a bit of mixed reporting there on Julian Nagelsmann. I, I think at one point, obviously, I'm a bit concerned, like, he is, he's not convinced to come regardless of, like, who's going to be a sporting director. But on the other hand, I'm kind of happy about that because... I think he realises that's where the club is going wrong or he realises that that is important for a club to have like a vision and a strategy going forward and I don't think it's easy to marry that up until there's a sporting director in place first which can line up with a new manager but what, what do you reckon about this Nan Guzman stuff? I don't know if I'm like overlooking into it but overanalyzing it but what does concrete talks mean? Does that mean that there's been talks they just haven't been official like have they been doing it through representatives or is it you know like he, so when we hear that Nagelsmann is open for the job is that because mm. his agents are saying yeah yeah we're willing to talk we're willing to talk we're willing to talk but wait do not come to us until he, that you have the director of football is that kind of how I'm reading it I th I'm guessing yeah. what I get I'm what I would assume this means is that um, he's interested in the opportunity. He likes the size. He likes maybe the project of the club in terms of the size of the club and how much their upside there is. But he's not going to talk about like football vision or salaries or anything like that. Right. Anything like real concrete about joining until he has something that he can really um, get his teeth into. Like like uh, well, once he has a sporting director, then they can have a real discussion about okay, where do you see the team going? What kind of players would you like to sign? All the like you know, how long would you like, want to contract? for all these kind of concrete things I think they've probably had like tentative talks like would you be interested once we get our shit together basically would you be interested in maybe considering <laughs> us as your next job <laughs> I'm guessing that's kind of that's kind of you know, the conversation you know when we actually start um, you know functioning like a football club we'll go <laughs> you're, you're in though right you're cool you're solid <laughs> it's like Jesus get your stuff together Jesus. I know it, I, it, it I, drives me nuts like I would have just been, I, 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 obviously I would not go to the guy unless you have a solid plan for a DOF who's going to, who's going to have the same vision, right? What is the point getting him to talk about DNA, style of football, therefore team structure, type of players, signings, it all, it's all, all spiral downwards. He can't talk about anything unless he knows who the DOF is what the recruitment is, what's the style of player that, that they've all been looking at already, like who's the style of player that's going to fit the puzzle of his type of players and the current setup. But the good thing is that if if I'm him, I'm thinking like Son, Kane, Hoiberg, all right, okay, like, um, you know, Bentancur, like Kulisewski, all right, okay, we've got something, we've got something, Romero, we've got something to work with there. Like, so I can see he could be like, yeah, if, if Spurs are interested, fair enough. But there's nothing to talk about until they're serious. And that's what the thing that annoys me is that we are still not serious. That drives me nuts. Get a director of football. Yeah, I completely agree. And I feel like this is all stuff as well. The Tottenham in a position right now where 
like we want it we need to appoint a director of football first we're talking to managers and this whole process is being delayed but it doesn't it should it didn't have to be this way all this is a cause of consequence of a lack of long-term planning by by the board which has been evident for so long and that's that's really what a lot of the fans are frustrated about it's not necessarily like we're obviously this we're not necessarily frustrated with the structure of the club and like we want to be self-sustainable and we want to earn our money and reinvest it, all this kind of stuff that that's a viable way of running the club but it's the long-term planning on the footballing side which has really been um, left by the wayside and that's really frustrating we're, we're, we're basically at risk now on missing our maybe first choice targets for managers and long term planning for next season because of all, all the lack of planning previously the whole Paratici debacle how we ha- we've maybe held on for, to, to Conte for a bit too long and could have started planning before that this whole mess could have definitely been something that could have been sorted out beforehand and now we're in a situation where we, we want Nargs when he might be interested but we we could miss out on him he could even go to another club because we just don't have our shit together right now and by the time we do who knows maybe he's agreed to deal with PSG maybe he's agreed to deal with Madrid or something we don't know whereas right now it's possible we could have got him in the door and agreed to us if we had our shit together right now but that's the kind of frustrating thing and who I think I think of it like this like who is running this club like day to day you know there's so many people with so many titles when you look through the company structure and it's like all I can imagine is like three or four orangutans just like dragging their knuckles, like what? Like what what you yeah, Paratici is what Paratici's gone, right? Like we how long have they known that Paratici's gone? Should we get a, a, should we get some candidates even before he announced, okay, fair enough. Like they should have had the very next day should have been here's our candidates and here's our in- interviews. We will know by the end of the week who's the DOF. Like that just feels like that's not even just the way football teams run. That's like should be the structure of every company, you know, like you, if you don't have a contingency plan in a moving market, what the hell is wrong with you? Like, cause anything can happen at any time. Right. So I just, it, it's so lazy and it, it, it speaks to like, you know, what we'll probably come out and speak about, but it's not just like the training ground. It's not just the players. It's everything at the club. It's just so back foot. It's so not on mm. your toes to move. Like let's, let's make this a vibrant, upbeat, fast moving club. Let's, we'll roll with anything that happens. We, we're never in that. It's always like, oh, oh, well, we've hired a guy who's a criminal. He might go to jail. He might get banned forever. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. God forbid we look at any contingency plan from this guy get booted out of football forever. What? What's happened? He's been booted out of football forever. Ah, don't worry about it. Let's go and ask Nagelsmann if he wants to come and take a punt. Idiots. Next Quite next next update <laughs> <laughs> well the next update is uh <laughs> i agree it's not the it's not a great news as well this coming out of um germany the Bayer leverkusen ceo has said that he expects um javi alonso to be at the club next season he says he has a contract with us until 2024 he is happy here we are happy with him and we are drawing working together and i'm sure we will be with him next season the evening standard also now reporting that after this um statement that Alonso is not will not leave by Leverkusen by Leverkusen this summer as and is expected to stay um obviously he was one he was of interest to Tottenham and even some reports saying he was a number one target I mean obviously as the CEO will say that won't he but um I do you think he's look he's only been at Leverkusen for eight months he's done a really good job be there in a European semi-final tonight um do you think it'll be too early for him to just uh you know leave this summer and join Tottenham yeah it's one of those things it's like it's such a dubious role, like when you're a young coach and, and it's like your first big job, you know, because Leverkusen is a big job, you know, it's like, and obviously he's, he's he'll be someone because he's a, a, a class player. He'll be like, you know, um, flying on the wings of his name, but you won't want to mess around on your first job. If he does well with them, like they, you know, they're doing really well right now. The next few weeks could be huge for him. There's no way that you tie your name to another club you know especially another club that's in potential turmoil like i it's the same thing with the um, company you know that I, that was the least surprise ever when company signed a new deal you know and i, I and i wouldn't be surprised if you know like alonzo ties him is, is he in, in a, a, an extended contract anyway alonzo um 
has he uh, well he's only got until 2024 there's no, i don't think there's i don't know if he's got a clause where they can just extend it but he's only, he, he clearly only signed an 18 month deal i guess because they're a pretty big, big club it's his first job maybe they didn't want to commit to a, a long-term deal but he's doing very well so i i wouldn't be surprised if in the summer they try and get him to sign on for a more longer term yeah, if he, if he does well, I think that's a foregone conclusion. He's got a good rapport with the team. They'll be on a high. Why would you want to then step off that hype train and, and then come and deal with something that it's it's a big club. Spurs are a big club. Money-wise, I can get that it's it's big. A chance to work with players like Harry Kane and um, you know a, a lovely stadium. All that stuff, I just don't think that really makes any real meaningful sense to a real football person who's going to be like i've built a relationship that's the big thing with with football teams right it's like building a relationship that you think can last and if you can get it into the second season and do well then you know it's also a risk for him but i think that's just the safer road to go down keep building a rapport with that team do well and then make a step up yeah know? And Lever Leverkusen is like a pretty decently sized club as well, if, um, yeah. to, uh, like in t respectfully. So, like for that club of that size, like th they wouldn't want to just a manager for eight months and him just jumping ship. I think it would be a tad di tad bit just disrespectful for Alonso just to jump ship after eight months. But look, these managers, especially modern day, with, with their short lifespans, you have to be ambitious because they they know the clubs aren't going to be loyal to them if results stop. So, in a way, he knows what. Like maybe sometimes when you're at when you're at your peak, maybe that is the time to leave. Sometimes, but I think eight months is a bit a bit very uh, short term. Um, yeah. The next update is talking about Harry Kane, and now Harry Kane has definitely been doing the rounds over the last few days which i find yeah. quite interesting um he's been doing a number of interviews he did one with sky sports and now he's recently done um an interview with be in sports surrounding um next season and uh, he has had some interesting things to say um he's talking mm -hmm. first of all he's talking about the club culture um he was asked about that in an interview he says i think some of the stuff internally which i won't go into here just some of the standards have maybe dropped around the training ground which need to improve because there are small details that can make that can make you a competitive team or make you a team that's fighting um around sixth or seventh place that's something we will talk about and try to change internally next season he also says i feel like we've lost a bit of connection with the fans over the last year or so we need to try to get that back as a team and try to get together in one moment and push each other to be successful asked about his values and his ambitions he says i'm always fighting to win the team trophies it's the only thing in my career i haven't quite achieved yet I still feel good. I'm not panicking. I'm in no rush. I feel like I've got plenty of years left to do that. It just makes me hungrier each preseason to improve, to get better, and to ultimately find a way to help the team win trophies. Now, I think what's interesting when he says, I think some of the staff internally, which I won't go into, some of the standards have dropped around the training ground. What do you do? You think? Do you think he's maybe saying this, like um, quality-wise, in terms of maybe the team? Is he maybe saying in terms of coaching staff? Maybe they're the the standards maybe they're not keeping the same standards they used to under Pochettino what do you think he means by um the staff here or well, he obviously doesn't want to point to anyone directly but I think those are kind of interesting and telling comments aren't they they're huge like but so I would say like if you will if we look at it like let's take a subtractive look at it it, it won't be equipment right like it just won't be it won't be it won't be like the really the, the, the club right it won't be you know um, dietary stuff, so that so the eating and stuff. Like you, you, you can imagine, like Levy's trying to cut down costs, so the, the you know the foods like not cooked properly. Won't I just I can't for a, my, for the love of God see that it's that. So I think he's got to either be talking about like um, maybe scheduling of training. Like are they training twice a day, once a day? Like what's happening? Like is there a co coherence between the fitness, like the the body coaches, the actual muscle coaches, and the actual training staff? Like, is there like that whole routine, you know, because a, a routine of a professional footballer is quite like militant, you know, you turn up nine, you're doing this training, this training, this training out in the grass and you're doing recovery, you know, it's quite, it can be quite militant, but you need that routine. And if that is in any way kind of dipping because of obviously the different coaches coming in and then one fitness coach who's, who seems like he's running everything is gone. Then they're, they're moving people in. You can see things starting to slip. But I, I kind of read what he was saying there as standards of like coaching and player expectations. Like, so if, the, if those two things drop, then for me, it explains 
everything. It, and it doesn't just go, oh, it's the players, oh, it's the coaches. No, it's it's there's problems on both sides. And it's like the expectations, like once um, this co- coach goes or, the, or once a, a, a member of this coaching team goes, then the players start to like dip or, oh, we're getting a day off. We want more days off. We don't want to do this running. We're doing too much this, you know, like, so it's like you, we're doing too much and then we get a win. They go see like that, that works now. You know, instead of sticking into your routine that you need, your regiment, like with a, with a real plan from a real coaching staff that says this is the way we go, like which obviously you need a good coach to make you believe that that's the way to go. But these things can just be chipped at. And I think that what I'm hearing from Kane is that from Poch, I feel like he's saying we had a regiment and we had a belief in the team and we had a, a management structure. Everything around all those things felt good. And since then, the standards have been steadily dropping. You've, we've been bringing in big managers who are supposed to just go, yeah, here's this strategy, here's this uh, and play style. Go on and then win, you know? And it's like, mm. that doesn't work. It's like, we've lost an essence of what made Spurs Spurs. And I, I heard that in that, that he's crying for that to come back, which is good, but it's also like, how did we let it drop that bad? And it's amazing that it's coming from him because he really is the captain, right? He's like the, mm. the guy. It's amazing that it comes from him because it's like, it's basically saying to the board, we need to get this back on the road or else I'm gonzo. That's how yeah, I Yeah, it. it's interesting when we, he, he keeps to harping back to Pochettino and um, the culture around the club around then and maybe what's changed because I know Pochettino was known for his brutal double training sessions, very, very mm. few days off. I remember Trippier said like he um, when he was at Burnley and stuff like uh, he used, they used to have like every Wednesday off and there was just a lot of time off. Then he went to Tottenham and it was very different. Like during the year, you literally, you have the end of the season and then when you, once you come back from pre-season it's back to double sessions you get very little days off it's like a brutal session but then when you get on the pitch you're never in a better shape than when you were um under Pochettino yeah. because of the way he pushes you and I want but it's interesting when he says why the standards have dropped and things like that because when you think about Mourinho and Conte like they're known for being these managers who only accept the best they they they, they demand the most from their players and it seems well, as though may- said, don't you remember Mourinho said I'm not here to baby them. They're professional mm. athletes. Be in there working mm. out. And that was mm. kind of scary. Like, oh, whoa, whoa, no. The coaching staff make the regiment and then the, the, the recovery team come in. And if and if your recovery team aren't on p- path of and know your schedule and, and then work your muscles to get you like the right amount of heat, the right amount of ice, the right amount of massage, you know, to then go out and handle another session or then do this the next day. If, if there isn't, um, congruity between those two teams, then it will fall apart. Muscles and players, like they, they don't just sit there and go, "Yeah, cool, I want to." Yeah, I'm, I've told my muscles to go out and perform today. It's like, no, if you if the, if the recovery team don't get them doing the right kind of Pilates and aerobics, and you know, and, and the muscle team don't get them bur- building the muscles right, training doesn't matter. It's going to fall mm. apart, and that then that tells you because you, you see that that did kind of happen with Mourinho then. When we lost, um, the, the, when Conte lost his guy, because Con- with Conte it looked like it was going incredibly well. We lose that guy, and it looked like it all went to to hell because mm. we get injuries, and and so that's what it kind of seems to me is like, it's the, it's like that whole staff is just like it's all like um you know square pegs and round holes. It's, they're not working together. It's not right. It's like and and everything just goes. Oh, these players are just uh, they're just throwing their toys at the pram. It's like. Get, they, you might have a beautiful kind of um, palace here, but the staff in it are not working right with them. So how can you get them to go out and perform on, in front of 60,000 people every week? I also, kind of- I also feel like since the Pochettino era, like getting all these, like, obviously under Poch, we, the team was not only growing and it was younger, but it was like hungry to prove themselves like on the stage mm. and i felt like everyone was working towards that same goal was like um there was that you there was like, that fight in their eyes as 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 conte would say that fire in their eyes to prove themselves and be hungry to win games and and challenge the top and i felt like maybe once we got conte and re and Mourinho through the door maybe the players were like kind of had this feeling like 
well, we have these world-class managers now. Oh, okay, we've made it. We're now at the top. And maybe that hunger and that, and that drive to kind of start... Because maybe they had that unearned sense of being players at the top without winning anything. Whereas under mm -hmm. Pochettino, they always had that... That I felt, even, even in games, they always worked super hard. They would always be so, so hungry. And maybe yeah. having these big-name managers gave these... Maybe that allowed, in a weird way, the standards to drop uh, among the squad because they felt like they'd reach a stage which they hadn't actually reached yet in terms of how good they were and where they were as a club and a team, which I think is totally. interesting. And it starts also at the top down as well. It's like you've got these standards of how, how you want to train and they have to be super, super high. They have to be at the level of like how you want to perform. Then you have these standards of how you want to perform in the game. And you have to, these standards of, of every single player in their position, how they have to, to perform, right? And it's like, but wait, if if you've kind of come away from a Champions League final and, and you've had a real like your your souls have been battered for not winning after that, right? So so then there's like a mental lag that's happening with certain players. And then at the top, you're not replacing players in very important positions. That tells you that the, the top doesn't have standards. So mm. wait, you're expecting these managers to come in and try to do incredible things that they've done at other clubs with world beating defenders and world beating strikers and world beating midfielders but yet you're not willing to lift your standards of the club and buy and play to put those cogs in that system so then it's at the top the standards are dropped there then they're going to just going to be a knock-on effect you know and then and then you end up looking at and then you end up like we can say that we are angry and, and hate when players last for ages and i i don't like Eric Dyer, you know, that's kind of well known. But you can imagine being Eric Dyer, right? It's like, it's not my fault. I'm still at this club. I'm trying my hardest. If, if there is a standard issue, if there is no one around to lift players up, there, there's no one around to like actually see what they're going through. Like, and then he's just getting all the blame. What, just because he's still in a job? It's like, mm. that's not his fault. That's the top. That's like that's the selection. That's all the way up. It's it's not the players in a way, you know. Like he's never going to get better unless they bring in a mental coach. I think Dyer with a mental coach. If there was an actual another team that came came on board, three or four uh, mental coaches that go around with the attackers, with the defenders, with the midfielders, and built them like built up their their psyche to be really really strong. Eric Dyer could be a great player. It's just he has a mental issue. Larice had a mental issue, you know, it's like, so that's what I think as well is another thing with the standards of the club is like, I feel like under Poch, they were way more mentally tight as well. So it's so many things that just ends up having the club in this, in this position where I, I'm thankful that we've got Kane coming out at this point, saying things like that, because for me, it puts a lot of the puzzle pieces in to what the problem really was. Um. Wenger has uh, been talking about um, these Kane quotes in as well, and he's had his say on what he thinks the future holds for Harry Kane or what he would advise. He says, um, translated to me, it means that not everybody uh, gives a maximum. Not uh, Translated to me, not everybody gives a maximum during the training uh, to be good enough in the game. Is it down to character of the players or is it down to the whole atmosphere inside the training ground or the coaches? I don't know. If you are his agent, Harry Kane has one year to go. In one year, he's completely free what do you tell him give your club a last chance and then you go um, it's not about the money but in the end it's always about the money he'll go for less than 80 million and you don't find strikers of that quality for that much if you uh, you need to live every day with players to know what's really going on and what works and what doesn't work you have to create a culture inside the club that allows the players to perform you need to you need clear rules for everybody to see what you tolerate and what you don't tolerate when you talk about values most of the time it's about what is not tolerated players like Kane have high standards and he's now frustrated because for years the team looked on the way up and for the last two and three years they have looked to have failed again so that's yeah. what um, Arsene Wenger has been saying about Harry Kane and his future. I look, I, I mean, it's hard to disagree with anything he's saying. It's hard to hear 100%. it from an Arsenal legend. Yeah. But what can I like? It's hard to disagree. I'm, I think he's absolutely right when he says, you know, Harry Kane, he's probably frustrated with the standards. Because let's be honest, like, despite the standards of the club slipping for the past four years, his standards have haven't. That, and that's no. the reality. His standards are may, maybe not, have, and he, he, on the contrary, he's probably even gotten better because uh, four years ago, he was having a few injuries. He was uh, missing a lot of games and maybe he wasn't impacting games in the same way he is. And then for the last two or three years now, 
He's been absolutely sensational um, and really yeah. taken his game to a new level. And he's kind of adapted his game, and yet he's kind of surrounded by a culture which uh, is frustrating. But what is interesting, I do find, about these Kane quotes is he does seem to be doing the rounds, like, in terms of talking to the press. He does seem to be constantly talking about next season. And, like, mm. with what Wenger is saying here, do you think he's, like, doing this with a view of being here next season? Or do you think maybe he's learning from mistakes of maybe two years ago when he was doing these, um, you know, interviews with Gary Neville when talking about how yeah. maybe it's a crossroads? And yeah, and maybe there's, even though he's what he's saying is what want to hear in a way he's still maybe thinking about leaving in the summer i think he's in like a a good like an interesting position for himself is like he could he could just you know run out his contract and go to wherever in the prem you know um and it'll be his choice um i think he's kind of speaking out what it sounds like to me is that he's speaking out he's telling the club you have to raise your standards like you have to raise the standards. There's like if you if we did have an incredible season next season with a really good coach, a, a good director of football, and they bring in a real system and a culture that fits with his standards, because I think he's the, the standard bearer at this point. He is the level. And if, if we have just if we have seven or eight players playing anywhere near his standard every week, we win things. We win a lot. We become a dominant club. And so that's what we should be aiming for. Not these, well, Spurs, we don't spend money like that. How can you get by players on Harry Kane's level? That's just bogus to me. Because you can go out and scout Alex Scott as a cam. You could go out and get young players who are incredible, who will look up to him as a god, and and, and with a right coach will come in and play their hearts out. You don't have to go and get the, the, the biggest names on the planet. You know, it's about it's about the management, it's about the culture, it's about keeping your stars and then building stars around them to play in a certain way. Poro's a good buy that way. Poro was a midfielder or a winger, and even as a wing back in the right system, hundred percent, that that could, he could get up to Kane's level. Do you know what I mean? We we starting mm. to see that. So it's it's that. I think he's just saying he's like, like we need to build rebuild the relationship with the fans. So he's trying to get build relief, uh, build them. Um, you know, he's trying to build this emotion between the fans again and, and build up next season and try to get the fans back on board. But the thing that sums up Harry Kane just recently is that goal he scored against Newcastle. Team's down five. He goes and picks up the ball and just, just pushes and pushes and then buries a really top-class finish. And it's 5-1. And, and you're thinking, like, you're looking at him going, wow, this guy is just, what What are we <laughs> doing? You know, what so if that's... Yeah, and then and then for him to say that, as if you raise the standards, I will stay. I will give you one more season. I will, uh, and and if you and if we do well, I will stay. If if we were challenging for a title, if we were like getting to the final of a, of a, a, a competition next season, if we won a Carabao, Kane will stay. I think he'll sign a new contract because he he'll believe. He you can tell. I think as well um, between the lines, you can tell that he wants to do it with this club. How? sad would it be if he leaves and then just goes to another team and wins everything for us it will be the saddest thing because it it, then we'll look at these words that he's saying now and he's saying left your standards like i could go any basically what i'm hearing is i could go anywhere and win easily right but left mm-hmm. your standards and do it here he's for me it's like maybe i'm just hearing it because my ears are pleading every day with <laughs> daniel levy you know like i'm pleading internally with daniel <laughs> <laughs> So maybe I'm just hearing that he's saying, please, lift the standards, bring in a top manager with a top system, fluent system, bring in great talent. The the one thing that, that I, I can't understand, so and, and some of the things he said recently have been, you know what he said, that thing about um, our, our defence after a game. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, whoa, because this is the first, that was the first time, and I kind of felt it was him going, enough is enough. Our defense is not good enough. And he's not talking about Romero. You know that, right? Mm -hmm. So he's basically going, Eric Dyer is not good enough. And that's the thing that's kind of like, because that's his friend. And if, and so I, it's like you can't win with your friends. It's good to become friends, but you, you can't carry players like that, you know? Mm. And so that's, so I'm add that to this. I'm starting to see, see Harry Kane is realizing that we can't just be, best friends. I, he can go play golf with them every week if he wants when he's playing at Millwall next season. You know, Eric Dyer. <laughs> you yeah. know, he, he can hang out with them, but, but you can't 
it, it's got to be now. I think he's just getting so serious about this next year. It's got to be now. This mm -hmm. club has got to raise its standards now or else it just won't happen in my time here. And that would be probably one of the biggest uh, and saddest indictments of the hierarchy in a weird way, despite 20 years of not winning a trophy and everything. If we have one of the best strikers, not the best striker in the world, currently give, who's given over 10 years of his playing career to Tottenham and yeah. who's willing to stay and we can't, and even though he's willing to stay, we can't get our shit together to an extent that he's convinced that this is a place for him to be. Like if, and we get in such a bad situation that he has no choice but to look at other places because we're just such a shit show that would be the saddest indictment for me of how, how this yeah. club is run and that would be um, a real really really um, sad ending but look I'm, I'm, I'm glad that he's still open to it let's hope things can move I don't think I've, for me I, for me, it looks like to me he's not going to leave in the summer but I don't think he's going to sign either and I don't know where that leaves us in terms of how uh, you know that, where that uncertainty is good for the club or not or whether it's good just to try and prove to him that we can be a club for him for the future um, I don't know it's good it's I, think it's I think good. it's going to be a tense wait. I, th I think it's good in a way because he's going, look, I'm not going to re-sign for you now, but if you invest in this team, if you bring in the right people, if you build the culture back up to the way we had it and the standards rise and we compete, I'll, I'll sign a contract. By the end of that season, mm -hmm. if we're competing, I'll sign a contract, you know? And then, mm -hmm. so I think he's actually finally got it into this position where he holds the cards again and he's not willing to just go, yeah, well, what have you got? What, what What's your plans? Oh, yeah, cool. I'll mm -hmm. saying, no, not, that's not going to happen. You know, and I think it's really, it's heartbreaking for him because you know what it's like, like if you have your own football team, you know, I, I, every now and then I have to have these hard conversations with players that they were good for a while and then they're not because everyone gets better and you have to kick them out. You know, it's like being in a band for years. I had to have these hardcore conversations with the guitarist who was like letting his standard slip. You just go, sorry, mate, we got to let you go. Like, we can be best friends. We can hang out every night, but we got to let you go. And it's like mm -hmm. now finally Harry Kane is kind of coming to that realization. Like, I can't win anything with these with certain players around, me, you know? Uh -huh. Well, Brains, thank you very much for joining us for this video. Let us know in the comment section below anything we discussed into today's video. Let us know your opinions. Brains, thank you for joining us again on the today's video. Like, subscribe, and comment. Yeah. And as always, come on, you Spurs.